So I am so excited to be back here. Um, I get the privilege of speaking at, at many different ladies' conferences, and this one has always been one of my favorites in my memories. That when, when I came here five years ago today, Kathy, where are you? There she is. She told me on her Facebook memory today, it's five years ago to this day. That's pretty cool. Do I have this too close to me? Good? Okay. Um, so I am, I've been so excited when Deanna and Crystal reached back out to me um, to get to come. So I'm so thankful my daughter Briley um, gets to be with me this time and travel with me. I am married. My husband's a pastor. We're from Leesville, South Carolina. We have six beautiful children. She's the oldest at 19, and they go down every two years till they're nine. My last one's nine. Three girls and three boys. And they're all home holding the fort down, encouraging mom, so I appreciate that. Um, tomorrow, you'll hear more of my story, so if you're curious why I'm sitting up here in a wheelchair, you'll just have to wait till tomorrow. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a teaser right there. Um, I want us to pray. I... Deanna really and Crystal really had a burden about being rooted in Christ, and um, we want to set the, the right spirit with that tonight. So let's pray that God will give us clarity. I'm going to make y'all work and use your brains tonight. I, I love comedy. I love laughter. Um, I have a million stories I love to tell on myself. Life with a disability is hilarious. Um, but I, I feel like we need to dig into God's Word tonight. And I will make you use your brains. And I pray that God will give clarity um, to what needs to be said tonight. We will have fun, too. But let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to just get Lisha out of the way and, and use me as a vessel. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we feel your presence here already and oh how thankful we are for that. Where two or three are gathered in your name, you have promised to be in the midst. And we know you're here, Lord. And Father, we pray as we open your precious holy word that we would say nothing but what you have already spoken in your word. And Lord, we pray that you would just speak to our hearts tonight, Lord, and help us to see in your word what you're trying to say to women, uh, to us as women and followers of Jesus, and what it means, Father, to be rooted in you. So, Lord, just help us all to glorify you and everything that's done and said, and thank you for every speaker and every lady that's here. And just give us a great time together in you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the greatest light bulb moments for me in my Christian life was also one of the darkest times. And that is when you're struggling in your life to understand God. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever fully accomplished how to understand God? <laughs> no, it is a journey, isn't it? But one of the things that um, I think in Christianity that gets very misunderstood, and I don't think it's intentional, I think it's just the human nature of us that, that seeks to somehow not understand truly the grace of God. And there's something so religious in all of us that makes us feel like, Surely there's something else I need to be doing so God will love me just maybe a little bit more. And I don't think that's taught as much as it's caught, and I don't know how we get this cycled through. But it has happened for me. I was raised in a Christian home. I thank God for that. My daddy was saved off a bus, out of a bus ministry. He married my mother, who was the pastor's daughter. Um, he was serious about Jesus. He eventually became the assistant pastor of that church, the principal of the Christian school, had a family. God called him into a full-time pastorate. We moved from Indiana to Tennessee when I was nine years old for my daddy's first pastorate. From that pastorate, we were raised. We were homeschooled. We were taught about Jesus every day. I thank God for that. But I think we need to make sure that morality is not salvation, number one. Religion brings morality, but Jesus brings salvation. And I want to make sure as a mom of six children at home schools, and my kids are pastor's kids, and we raise them and talk about Jesus every day in our house, I cannot even have a conversation with my children with them being like, Mom, are you about to turn this into a lesson? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes, I am. 
If I die and the funniest thing, y'all sitting around as grown kids laughing, you know mama talking about Jesus all the time, I'll be okay with that. You know, I'm okay with that. But am I producing moral heathens? Or am I producing Jesus followers? Or am I being clear yet? Okay. So as we talk about rooted in Christ, and we talk about root issues versus fruit issues, I can see a lot of fruit in me, and I can see fruit in my children at times where I've taught them morality, but I've forgotten to teach them about being a follower of Jesus for the sake of the kingdom. I want to add a tiny disclaimer here, and y'all don't shoot me, but Jesus did not call us to Christianity. I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus did not call us to Christianity. Christians were called Christians in Antioch when they were being mocked. Look at those little Christ followers, right? But Jesus called us to be followers of Jesus. Jesus called us to be builders of his kingdom. When he prayed, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Did he say that or did he not? So we have the kingdom of God that came down in the form of Jesus Christ to bring us salvation so we could be citizens of the kingdom of God. And that is to what we are to be. That's why we are in this world, but not to be of this world. Does this make sense? So we talk about all these root issues versus fruit issues. And we say, I want the fruit. I want Christian fruits. I want Jesus fruit coming out of my life. I want others to see Jesus in me. Is that not the point? I want others in this world to look at me and mock me and say, look at that little Christian, little Christ over there. We, we think that's a bad thing when we get mocked. No, that means you're doing something right because that's when they were called that. And nowadays we're like, now you hear the world many times saying, oh, I didn't know you could do that as a Christian because we're not living like, like little Christs, are we? So what, why? And then as a pastor's wife, my, I married, I went to a Bible college, I married a Christian man, the Lord called him in the ministry, he called him to be a pastor, and almost 10 years ago, I become paralyzed. And here I was, raised in a Christian home, which I am so thankful of, taught to serve Jesus, sheltered as a homeschooler, thank God, I no problem with that either, made, care, made sure I was careful, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I read my Bible, I pray, I tithe, I go to church, I witness, I do all these right things that we should do. That's not the, that's not the problem. But when my tree got shaken, I did not like the fruit that fell off of that. There were things in me and in my heart that if you'd asked me a year before, would you ever say or think that, I'd have said, you are insane. And that is why our hearts are just so deceitful and wicked. And who can know it? Because when you are shaken to your core, you will think things. You don't believe me? Let's just go talk to Job. Did the man not say some horrific things because he was hurting so bad? I just read a blog that said, when people are grieving and they're hurting, just be careful. They're going to say and do things that they will regret someday when they're in a better place. Let it blow away like the wind. Don't take it so to heart because they'll regret it. Pray for them, be there, encourage them in the Lord, but don't think that's their whole new life. But that comes from something. That comes from something inside of us that when trials and tribulations and the heat hits you, it boils up this dross, doesn't it? And you're like, that is so hideous, I won't even say it out. I remember one day driving in the car, going to therapy, and there was this song, I don't know if you heard about it, Victoria's Valley Girls Home or something used to sing it called There Is Hope. And it says, sometimes we go through trials that are so hard to bear. We lift our face towards heaven saying, God, are you really there? And that song, I'm like, oh, yeah, feeling that. And I said to my husband, you ever thought that? And he's like, what? (laughs) I'm like, have you ever thought, God, are you really there? He's like, no. And I'm like, yeah, me either. Like, <laughs> don't, don't, I mean, I just want to make sure you're all right with Jesus and stuff. <laughs> what are the fruits of the Christian life? 
Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and don't turn there. Just listen for a minute. I mean, you can turn there if you want to, but we're going to be in John 15. But I want to read it to you. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, gentleness, which is kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. Y'all, if I was going to have to start speaking this to you and he's playing that game, I was feeling a little competition there. <laughs> Against such there is no law. Read that list again. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Am I the only one struggling with that list? All these things, these fruits that are supposed to be on my tree, that's what Scripture says they should be. Not read your Bible, pray, be a good woman, don't cheat on your husband, tithe, witness, be faithful to church, all those things. Are those bad things? No! But according to God's Word, the fruit of the Spirit is there. I can't even be on Facebook and do that list. People just push my buttons. I'm always like... (laughs) Do y'all delete? I delete way more than I post. (laughs) Because I have... Lisha has so much to say. And then Jesus is like, you going to really do that? And I'm like, no. Delete, delete, delete. I am a failure at all of those things. And that's good. You know why? Because I cannot do those things. Let me tell you a story about this little boy. He lived on a farm, and he did not like to go to bed. He loved playing in the barn with the animals, and he did not like to shut down like most little boys don't like to. And every night his mom and daddy would tell him, you got to go to bed. He'd go up the second story and he'd go in his room, but there was this fruit tree outside his window. So he'd wait till mom and daddy weren't watching anymore and he'd shimmy down that tree, run to the barn, play till he was done. And then when he was done, he'd climb back up the fruit tree and go to his room. And he just loved that little process. Well, he was feeling really good about it. Well, one day he heard his daddy say, honey, said to his mama, honey, that fruit tree hasn't bore any fruit and I'm going to chop it down. Tired of looking at it. It's not any use to us. Well, that little boy just panicked. Panicked. There went his way of escape. So he ran to the next farmer over and said, Farmer Brown, may I have apples? I need lots of apples. Farmer Brown said, Of course you can, buddy. You take all the apples you need. So he got a bunch of apples, and he hauled them back home, and he hung apples all over that tree. (laughs) And he was so pleased. The next morning he heard it. His daddy talking to his mom again said, Honey, 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 you're not going to believe it. That fruit tree has apples all over it. It's a miracle. And the mom said, For real? And the little boy's upstairs like, Yes, yes, yes. Daddy said, No, no, the miracle is it wasn't an apple tree. It's a cherry tree. (laughs) (laughs) And here's the point. We cannot produce the fruits of what? Of who? The Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. We can try. We can try. When I want more joy, I just have to watch the Dick Van Dyke show. I'm all over it. When I need more love, I just watch one of those sappy commercials on TV. It makes me cry. When I need more peace, I need to learn something. You know, just let me, let me have my time. Mm-mm. It's not going to last, is it? So today I'm hateful and I want to pluck that off. And tomorrow it just... There it is again. So if we cannot produce whatever we want to, and we know that the Holy Spirit does it, then I can never produce fruit by doing. We are not created as human doings. We are created as human beings. Yeah. Is that hard for you as a woman? We are fixers. We are doers. Aren't we, Marthas? Any Marthas out here? Absolutely. We are. And it's not wrong to do, okay? That's why I don't want you to misunderstand me tonight. It's not wrong to do. But there is something in us that is so willing to let that be enough. And it's not. It's not. 
So when our tree gets shaken up, and that could be something big, you know, the de- a horrible diagnosis, being paralyzed, um, the death of a loved one, um, losing your job that you're about to retire. I mean, there's, there's some biggies out there, aren't there? It can be something really big that can rattle your tree, and it can be something not so big. I have to tell you this story. I've told it ever I've spoke this, this year, this past year. Um, one day, my husband came to me, and he said, Lisha, I want to lose weight. I wish I had a chair up here because I have to set up this story, but you guys, can you all use your imaginations? Use your imaginations. So my husband, let me describe my vehicle first. I have a big Ford Transit cargo van. I mean, not a cargo van, but a passenger van, like the big church bus. It's a big van. And we moved out seats, and they made it all adaptive for me. So it's got one of those lifts that, you know, you open the side door, and the lift comes out, and then it goes to the ground. I roll on in it, and it lifts me up, and I roll in. I also have a driver's seat that on the driver's seat, if this is the steering wheel right here, okay, the driver's seat will come all the way back on a track and then it turns all the way around then my wheelchair I'll roll in next to it and and I'll roll in like this and then I can just transfer onto the seat my wheelchair stays here and then that seat goes right back and pushes me up the steering wheel and then I have hand controls and I drive my van well one day my husband said um, I want to go on a diet and I want you let's go grocery shopping I want you to help me pick out food that I can eat okay I'm all excited that's great he wants to do this by himself that's wonderful so we go, he picks up the first thing, I read the ingredients, and I say, honey, I'm sorry, that, that's not going to work, it's got too many fat grams. Oh, okay. Second thing he picks up, saying, oh, I, that has some really high sugar content. Okay. Third thing he picks up, well, you know how this is going to go in about two more items, right? I'm fired. And so <laughs> he said, you know what, honey, he said, it's my idea for a diet, so I'll just take care of it. I don't want you to help me anymore. Well, that ticked me off, it made me mad. He shook my tree, you know? And... And it made me mad because I felt like you asked me to come with you and help you, and now you're firing me because you don't like, it ain't my fault you picked up something with 12 grams of sugar, you know? (laughs) Just nod your head so I'll know I'm not the only wicked wife in the world. (laughs) Okay, so it made me mad, so I was all mad and huffy and puffy, and I'm like, fine, if you want to die of a heart attack, eat your sugar, whatever. (laughs) My mouth is my main sin. I don't drink and smoke, but I do very bad things with my mouth because it gets me in trouble all the time. I do not cuss, though. I do not. I, am not a, I don't cuss, so I am just mean I get mouthy and I get lippy. And so, and so we go through the store, and I'm just I'm aggravated the whole time. We're kind of just fussing like old people through the store, and we, we get checked out, and I'm still grumbling. I'm really mad at him, and so I go to get on my lift, and I have to back on my lift, and let me tell you something about this stupid lift. When you're mad, you know how you just want to get in your vehicle and slam the door when you're mad at your husband? Well, it's really hard to do that when you're like, <laughs> So I was already losing dramatic effect just trying to get in my vehicle. And I was really, that made me mad too. And so I rolled in a little too aggressively. When I get to the top, I had to roll in backwards. And since I was mad, I, you know, I rolled in. Well, I forgot that there are those two tracks on the floor you know, where that van seat will come back. So when I rolled in that back wheel, and I don't have no wheelie bars on this thing because I pop wheelies, so they get in my way. I don't want nobody in the way of popping wheelies. And so I don't have those little wheelie bars. And so he was at the back of the van putting the groceries in. I'm slowly getting mad and getting in. And I roll backwards, and I just flipped over, like, boom, that quick. I roll back, and next thing I know, my head, if this was a driver's seat, my head was somewhere between the wall and that driver's seat, one leg was up in the window. <laughs> the wheelchair was dumped over, and I was pinned. Like, I could not move. And I hear some idiot woman in the parking lot say, Hey, sir, she just fell over in your van. <laughs> That's about to take me back to the adult center. <laughs> and so my crazy husband, who always panics and screams, always, I have fallen over more than one occasion, and he always screams, well, this gigantic van door is open this big. Do you know the way the man entered the van? He comes all the way to the driver's door, trying to squeeze his six-foot, 250-plus body between the steering wheel and that thing to climb over all over everything. <laughs> and I said, I am not hurt. I am not hurt. He's like, oh, oh, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> and I was still mad at him. And I didn't... I did not want him in my van, even. And so he 
like gets it all together and gets me up, puts me back, and I'm just sitting there. And I said, just put me in the back seat and drive home. Just put me in the back seat. So he sits me on the seat, and we get 50, mi- 50 feet from that spot, parking spot, and I just busted out laughing. He said, why are you laughing? I said, because five minutes ago, I was ready to throw you off a bridge. And now I cannot do this without you. <laughs> and I just started laughing. He said, woman, you are crazy. <laughs> but don't we do that with God? We do. We're like, we get so upset at him and not understand what he's doing. But we cannot do this life without him. We just think we can. And when our tree gets rattled, we realize real quick, what are we rooted in? So what are we supposed to be rooted in? That's when we want to go to John 15. Are you like me when you read Scripture, you just read it sometimes, you know, and mark it off your Bible chart and feel real good about getting your Bible reading done today? I, I'm bad at that too. And, and, and anything's better than nothing, let me tell you that. But let's remember, remember, that reading God's Word is not for information. Reading God's Word is for transformation. And how do we get from information to transformation? Application. So I have to read God's Word or I won't know what it's saying. But it does no good if I don't apply it to my life so it will then transform me. That's the proper mindset when you get into God's Word, okay? So we're going to get into John 15 and we're going to break it down. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Let's just stop. Who is the vine? Who is the vine? Jesus. Who is the husbandman? The Father. Let's not miss that, okay? I am the vine, Jesus said. Now, first of all, let's set this scene. Jesus had this... Jesus tickles me. He does. When I read scripture, I just laugh right out loud sometimes. At, I was studying today in the hotel, and poor Briley was trying to do college work online, and, and I just started busting out laughing. And she said, what are you laughing at? I said, Jesus just cracked me up. <laughs> she said, are you about to tell me about it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Finally, she's like, Mama, I really need to finish this chapter. I'm like, okay, you just have to hear me tonight. <laughs> John 51, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, if we stop right there and I say, would you please explain that verse to me? Well, every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he's going to take away and cut off. And every branch that beareth fruit, he's going to purge it, that it will bring forth more fruit. What does that mean? What I love about Jesus is Jesus could be talking and having a conversation. And suddenly he says, consider the fig tree. And I'm sure the disciples were like, I didn't know we were talking about fig trees. (laughs) And Jesus like, we are now. We are now. He did that all the time, pointing to nature, did he not? The sparrows, the lilies of the field, the fig tree. And here I'm quite sure he and the disciples, I don't really know because I wasn't there, But I can imagine they're walking and talking and he's teaching them as he constantly poured into them and he sees a vineyard. And he looks at the vineyard and he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. I'm going to skip us over to Matthew 15 and I'm going to read something real quick. And this is what I got tickled about. Matthew 15. What does it mean, every branch in me? Because I started questioning, does that mean people are saved? And if they don't bear fruit, he's just done with them? What does it mean? Let's read Matthew 15. Start verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Whoa. Whoa. That's a major sin. This religious crowd is all worked up because they forgot to wash their hands before they eat. 
that's funny, y'all, laugh, that's funny. (laughs) But he answered and said unto them, well, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. And this is the part that made me giggle. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? (laughs) Well, probably so. (laughs) They were already offended. Y'all didn't wash your hands. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, shall be rooted up. And that's what he's talking about. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. What is he saying? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you're not bearing fruit, you ain't a part of the vine already. You're a fraud. You're acting like a branch. But your heart is not. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. They say the vines get so heavy that they'll lay, they'll drop down into the ground. And the fruit on those vines is so heavy, it's now laying in the mud and where it can be trodden and rot up against the ground. And if you do gardening, you know you've got to keep some kind of circulation, right? Or it's going to rot. And that the gardener would come and pick up that vine and wash it off and clean it up all that fruit so it doesn't rot, get the mud all clean, and he'd rehang it to where it could then bear more fruit. You need to understand that. Once you get this picture in your head, okay? It's getting sweeter, girls. It's getting sweeter. So he purges it. That purges word is kathiro in Greek, and it means cleans it. He cleans it. Verse 3. Now he's going to say how he cleans us. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The book of John starts out, John 1, 1, what's the verse? In the beginning was the, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who cleanses us, girls? The word. Who is the word? Jesus. He is the word. Abide in me, and I in you. So now we're going to stop there. What does the word abide mean? So many times our English words take this huge meaning that was given in the original Hebrews and Greek, and we try to, we do the best we can, you know? But sometimes we get one little word and we've missed this beautiful concept. Why don't you hear? You've got to hear this. This is about how many shout today. The word abide is a Greek word that's meno, M-E-N-O, meno, to stay, to remain to abide. In reference to a place, it means to tarry, to not depart, to continue to be present, to be held, to be kept continually. In reference to time, it means to continue to be, not to perish. That makes me think of a word that we shall not perish, but have everlasting life to last, to endure, to survive, to live everlasting life. In reference to our state or condition, it means to remain as one, not to become another. Aren't we told we're to be like Jesus, not to be as this world? 
to be, not to become another or to be different. God changes not. And we're to be like Jesus. And it's okay to abide, is to remain as one, to not become something else and not to be different than the what we're to be one with. We're going we're gonna to circle back to that word in a minute, so hang on to that. That's what abide. So he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. We live this backwards. I, I think. I think we live this backwards. We say, how can I better myself? How can I better myself so people can see Jesus out on my branches? I'm going to read more books. I'm going to read more blogs. I'm, I'm going to research psychology. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to call my, call my pastors and all my spiritual gurus in my life. I'm not knocking all those. I write a blog myself. I'm not knocking those. But we're talking about where you're rooted. Where you're rooted. Then we want Jesus just after we better ourselves. Jesus says, that's crazy. It's all backwards. He's the vine. We are the branches. We are absolutely dead without the life-sustaining flowing of Jesus Christ through every part of our being. He that abideth in me and I in him. He's the one I'm to tarry with. He tarries with me. He's the one I am not to depart, and he's not departing me. He's the one I'm continuing to be present with, and he continues to be present with me. He is the one who holds me. He is the one who keeps me. And I'm to hold on to him. And I'm to stay true to him continually. He continues this to be, to be, to be. And I'm to continue to be with him. He and I are to remain as one, not separated and different. Do you get what this word abide now means? God does not change, and God is faithful. So if we're not abiding in the vine, what's the missing link? Me. We can do nothing without abiding with him. We wonder, why are we so stressed? Why are we so weary? Why are we so joyless? Why are we so discouraged? Why are we so aggravated and short-tempered and quick to judge and negative and frustrated and frazzled and anxious and on and on and on? Is it just me? These are the temptations, are they not? When our tree gets rattled, big or little, because we can't do it. We can't. We're trying to do all this stuff, all this life, all this Christianity, we're trying to do all of it. Do and do and do and do. And it's really simple. Abide, 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 abide. If you are rootless, you are fruitless. That's what he's saying. Without him, without abiding in him. So we must stay there. So I'm going to quickly read verses 6 through 16 and end with verse 16. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Where do the lost go? Right. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye may bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even if I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. His joy, abiding in him, keeps our joy full. Do you want to be joyful? Me too. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Let's stop and think about that vineyard again. Think about that fruit laying on the ground. He says, I have chosen you. Then he said, and ordained you. Let's look at those words. Chosen you, God chose all of us. He chose all of humanity. That's why he came to earth and died, didn't he? But there are those that will not turn to the vine and their dead branches, and they will be cast away. But those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he said he ordained us. That word ordained, we kind of think of people putting your hands on you and praying for you into the deaconship or something, <laughs> or pastors. But that ordain means tethany. It means to set, to put, to place, to fix, to establish. I have ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. God chose us, ladies, right now. I don't even know where you are in your life. But I know this, as a pastor's wife who did love Jesus, I know something changed in me 10 years ago because no matter how many people told me they were praying for me, no matter how many times my husband would come read verses over me, it did not bring me peace. It did not bring me joy. This was not because I was not a Christian. It is because for so much of my life, I'd counted on my spiritual activity as my spirituality. And it failed me. It failed me. Does that mean those activities were wrong? No. But somewhere, Lisha got off. And Lisha forgot to abide in Jesus to where nothing else mattered. And it came to the place where I didn't care who you were and what title you had or what your name was. I didn't want to hear from anybody except God's Word. And I dug in. And you know what made it different? I was desperate. I was desperate for Jesus. And something wonderful happened. Wonderful happened. Jesus had never left me. Do you know what I love about the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? The very first sin. The very first sin. It's because God knew they had sinned. It said that Adam and Eve and God would walk together every day in the cool of the evening and have fellowship. That's what Scripture told us. And then when Adam and Eve sinned, they were naked, they went and hid behind a bush, and God came out at the same time that he always did. And he said, where are you guys? I find that so beautiful. Because he already knew. If it was in my house, I'd have been like, I know what you did. I know where you're hiding. And you better run. Because when mama catches you, I'll never forget the first time. My little Macy was two years old when I got in a wheelchair. And I, she was doing something. And I said, you need to come here to me. I was needing to correct her. And she just looked at me. And I looked at her, and I was like, you need to come to me. And she took off running, and she hid in that little crack between the wall and the refrigerator. And I couldn't reach her. I can only go that far. You know, I'm done. Go, go, gadget arms. You know, I'm going to get you. And I thought, this is going to be interesting, raising these kids. And I had to get her sister to come dig her out of that refrigerator, behind that refrigerator so I could, you know, correct her. <laughs> trying to say that as politically correct as I can. <laughs> Where are you in your life? Where are you? I don't know. But I know whatever you're going through, Jesus has chosen you. He's ordained you so that you will bear much fruit. He's placed you. He's fixed you right back on that vine where you need to be. Let's not jump out of the way of that. You're where you need to be for whatever it is you're going through. And you need to bear fruit. And I need to bear fruit. 
And the way we do that is to abide in the vine. And we abide in the vine. He says, oh, Eureka, there you go. I'm telling you to go bear fruit. Then I'm telling you, you can't do it without me. So then I'm telling you, I chose you and ordained you to bear much fruit. Then I'm telling you, you can't do it without me. There's a secret here and it's called abide in me. I chose you. I placed you where you need to be. You abide in me. You will bear fruit. When you bear fruit, the Father is glorified. When the Father's glorified, you are my disciple. Do we want to be Christians or do we want to be disciples? Do we want the title or do we want to build his kingdom? Do we want to waste our time playing games with words and all these things to know deep in our hearts, I'm a fraud? I don't even believe what I'm telling people. It's not even feeling real in my life. If that's where you are, may I call you back to John 15? It's not complicated. You pour your heart out to your Jesus. You tuck in close to him. And he will be there waiting for you. Let's pray. Father, we don't know why you're so patient with us. But we thank you, Lord, that you love us. You thank you, Father, that sanctification, you saved us and you have sanctified us. Father, we don't have to work for victory. Victory is won. Jesus already gave us the victory. Father, we work from that victory. Help us, Lord, to get out of the way that you may increase and that we may de decrease, that we have less of Elisha and more of Jesus. Father, oh, how Satan must tremble to get this many room, this room full of this many ladies that we get serious about abiding in you. Father, we pray we would, we would allow you to work in our life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.